This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. Returning to the podcast today for episode 59 is Jungian analyst, author, and eco-psychologist, Dr. Dennis Merritt in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He earned a PhD in entomology with a specialty in insect pathology from the University of California, Berkeley, and later went on to study psychology, earning a master's degree in humanistic psychology from Sonoma State University, and trained as a Jungian analyst at the C.G. Jung Institute Zurich. His areas of interest included synchronicity and the I Ching. Dr. Merritt is the author of the four-volume series, The Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe, Jung, Hermes, and Eco-Psychology, published by Fisher King Press. It includes Volume 1, Jung and Eco-Psychology, Volume 2, The Cry of Merlin, Jung, the Prototypical Eco-Psychologist, Volume 3, Hermes, Eco-Psychology and Complexity Theory, and Volume 4, Land, Weather, Seasons, Insects, an Archetypal View. Dr. Merritt believes that Jungian psychology, in the form of eco-psychology, offers perhaps the best system for diagnosing and understanding our disastrous relationship with the environment and with each other, and points out that the challenge Jung gave us was to unite our cultured side with what he called the two-million-year-old man within. Jung said that a new paradigm had to come to the West and countries influenced by the West, which is now the entire world. In 1940, he labeled that shift a new age, and the age of Aquarius. In an explosive new article titled COVID-19, Inflection Point in the Anthropocene Era, and the paradigm shift of Jung's new age, Dr. Merritt says he hopes the virus will do what the titanic hurricanes or the hellish wildfires in the United States in 2019 couldn't do, nor the fires in the Amazon, nor the toasting of the koala bears in Australia. Shock us into consciousness of the almost unimaginable significance of the present time. He says the good news is that human-created systems are at the root of most of our problems, systems that can be changed by humans. Jung said that his psychology was 500 years ahead of its time. And in this interview, Dr. Merritt hopes to make the case that the time is now. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, April 8, 2020, through the magic of Skype. Hello, Dr. Merritt. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, Pretty good. Probably like the rest of us in the country. um, Wake up and turn the news on. And the first thing we hear about is uh, coronavirus or COVID-19. So it's, um, there's a collective uh, heaviness in our culture. And individually, we all feel it in one form or another. Yeah, we sure do. And you said your background as a pathologist has really come to the fore. Yes, uh, I got uh, a uh, my doctorate. It was in entomology, as you said, Uh, but I went out to Berkeley to particularly work in insect pathology. That's diseases of insects to use microbial warfare against the insects instead of using chemical pesticides. So I am a, as much a pathologist in a way as I am an entomologist. And the, one of the reasons I went into insect pathology is I was thinking of uh, transforming into becoming a virologist. And I actually written up a grant proposal uh, to uh, study some of the, viro- the, vi- the viral dimensions of the insect pathogen I was working with. And that was approved by the National Institute of Health, but it wasn't funded. So that's how far along I got with pathology. So I've really been cued into this uh, coronavirus thing from the beginning. Plus, I have a daughter. My second daughter, the actress, lives in Hong Kong. And uh, she's been telling me about what it's uh, been like over there from the beginning. So uh, 
I've been acutely aware of what's been happening, uh, particularly here in America and with Trump. Did you want to tell us a little bit about what she's told you about what's happening in Hong Kong? Yes. Uh, well, I visited over there for the first time uh, about six, seven years ago. And uh, I was uh, amazed to see so many people wearing masks and workers going around spraying like the buttons you press to the elevators right. and the railings and everything. And I thought, gosh, are these Chinese really anal or what? Mm -hmm. But uh, they learned the lesson from SARS. And uh, they know how you have to deal with epidemics. Uh, plus, my daughter is somewhat of a germaphobe. Uh, so uh, she would tell me why they're doing what they're doing. And despite the fact that Hong Kong, you know, is, well, part of China, but, you know, it's connected to the mainland and they get a lot of mainland Chinese, their infection rates have been low. So when you have, and they're, they're calling this a unique virus, when you have something that's totally new um, on the world scene, there are no antibodies to it. That's why we are all so vulnerable. And it's painful to hear that it's going to take at least a year to develop a vaccine. We're not going to be able to get uh, totally back to normal until and hopefully if we can develop a good vaccine until we have antibodies. Uh, and until that time, uh, the, the way to go about it is the way the Chinese have done it in Wuhan. And today is incredibly significant. 8th of April, the news this morning was that Wuhan has been opened. So the Chinese learned the lesson from the SARS epidemic that started in China. And uh, they, they, from the beginning, adopted the procedure. Uh, there is a link. I don't think I put it in my article. But uh, um, there's a link um, from, I think, a BBC interview um, or, <coughs> excuse me, a documentary, little documentary about uh, the SARS virus. And it, they, the Chinese took some kind of brutal approach to it at the beginning, uh, you know, welding the doors shut of the infected people and dragging them out of the houses. Uh, you don't have to be that severe, but they knew that what you had to do was to identify the virus, means, means you had a test for it. You had to isolate the people right away and then check out all the people they had been in contact with and quarantine them. And for at least 14 days, whatever the, 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 the infectious period is. And that is what they did. And every epidemiologist in the world would have known, especially somebody at the federal level, like in the United States, like Fauci and so on, would have known that that's what you have to do. So there was no way in the world that Trump would not have been informed. And that's one thing that is so painful for me to, to do, to listen to Trump and his daily propaganda things about uh, now he's... Now he's saying, in true Trump counterpunch fashion, that the United that we should uh, United States should uh, not pay our share for the World Health Organization because they failed us in warning us about this. It it is it is painful for me uh, as a pathologist uh, to hear this type of thing. You say in your new article that he, Trump has been properly diagnosed as a malignant narcissist? Well, uh, uh, it, <laughs> it is uh, amazing. Uh, this, this man is, is absolutely amazing. And I think there's an archetypal, another archetype that's uh, as or more significant nurse than, nurse, uh, than a narcissist. Mm -hmm. The narcissist, of course, is that term, uh, that label comes from the myth of narcissus who was so totally enthralled with his own image that he eventually died. And his girlfriend, uh, Echo, could just echo what he had to say, and she turned into the narcissist uh, flower. Um, so uh, Trump is, everything is about Trump. Uh, you could <laughs> look at 
uh, his advisors and so on, they're all family members, so he's like the godfather. The trouble he's, um, is that he's made himself into the godfather as he would like to perceive it for the whole country. One of the reasons he admires people like Kim Jong-un and, and Putin um, he likes that strong man image. And um, a narcissist, they're actually very fragile people, and they're extremely sensitive to any criticism. And the pathology of the guy, that's why I think this moment is a turning point, an inflection point for the Anthropocene era, and I think an important moment uh, to move us into uh, Jung's new age, a new paradigm, is that uh, that people are dying. Mistakes made, especially at the highest level, when you need leadership and government coordination of the unfortunately limited uh, supplies we have for the frontline workers. There's no re reason that we should be so short-handed, especially at this point. So lives are being lost when, when Trump, for example, uh, is not said he was not going to uh, be so receptive to messages, uh, pleas for supplies and so on coming from governors that are criticizing him. That's how sensitive his ego is. That's how narcissistic it is. And that's malignant. That is pathological. And that is one of the ways that this virus is bringing to a head uh, what have been issues, uh, life-threatening issues, planet-threatening issues for so long now. That's what's so crucial about this moment. People are dying, uh, and when it comes to life and death issues, that gets people's attention, especially if they're not the ones who are so likely to get it. They have uh, relatives, they have fathers and mothers, old people, that they, they have friends and so on. Uh, they may have a, their favorite musicians. Uh, John Prine died yesterday. He was one of my favorite musicians. So it's affecting people in the developed world. But the worst is yet to come when it gets into countries where they don't have good health care systems, where you can't do uh, social distancing, where you can't clean your hands all the time and so on. We're just literally warming up. But thankfully, in a way, it's happening in the developed world first. We have all these uh, uh, social media and 24-7 uh, news hour and so on. So the, the population, in, in a way, in the whole world is, is um, tuned in because death is lurking all around us. I'd like to go back to something you said earlier about how China handled this issue because they learned from SARS. Did you mean that here in the United States, we are not taking the proper per precautions or we are late in doing so? Oh, we are painfully late. Yeah. That's what's been so agonizing uh, for somebody who knows something about science, or especially somebody who knows or a little more about the pathologic or epidemiology and so on, pathological studies in, in science. Uh, that's why Obama had uh, a group that was tuned into uh, the, uh, the, the potential for pandemics to rise in the world. Probably uh, all the uh, developed countries, the G7s and so on, had uh, uh, ca not cabinets, but departments and so on that we're keeping tabs on, on this type of thing because it's something science knows about. Uh, we know how these unique viruses emerge. Uh, like Ebola is a great example. It's when humans are in close contact with wild animals. Everything has a virus. Plants have viruses. Even bacteria have viruses. All living things have viruses. They're kind of the ultimate parasites. Um, so after the SARS epidemic, and then there was MERS, uh, all the developed countries would have uh, departments or some group that was keeping tabs on what was happening with infectious diseases in the world. Well, Trump got rid of that group. 
So we have nowhere in the at the federal level uh, did we have somebody uh, at a high level that could be informing the president. But it also highlights one of the main problems with Trump. He's kind of averse to science. Those are facts. And he doesn't like facts that contradict his view of the world and his narcissistic position. Yeah, let's take a look under that since this podcast is about Jungian psychology. I want to also look at things from a psychological point of view. And although you are not his analyst and it is not really ethical for you to um, diagnose him or maybe exactly look at him analytically, I'd like to maybe touch on what is underneath this, you know, stopping this funding or the United States not taking this seriously. And in in my case, I'll just add a personal note. I flew to a family event in February before this got really big. And it was suggested that we wear masks on the plane. And I brought masks with me for myself and my family members, and nobody in the airport was wearing masks. And so everybody was embarrassed to put them on. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, you mentioned your daughter's a germaphobe. I'm very familiar with that. I've been a germaphobe my entire adult life. And when I fly and stay in hotels, I bring disinfectant wipes and I wipe down the tray table on the airplane and I do get looks. I wipe down the armrests. I'm constantly washing my hands. I've always been like that. And it just seems like it's sort of frowned upon. Um, I don't get sick very often. I don't know why I'm talking about that right now, but I'm just wondering if our culture has, um, you know, we don't see people walking around airports with masks. I've done a bunch of podcast episodes over the past year with Dr. Murray Stein about the K-pop group BTS. They're always wearing masks Mm -hmm. in South Korea. Yeah, and South Korea is another country that has dealt with this very well. They 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 were very tuned into these uh, potential pandemic uh, problems, so they right away were able to do a lot of testing. That's the only way you can identify people are really. Um, ill from this and then you can isolate and that's where we've been way behind as well we dropped we were at least a month behind having tests we could have been preparing but I like uh, I'm glad you brought it back to the Jungian dimension I was going through the fact part of it if you will with Trump and science sort of yes and I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you I just just wanted to make sure that we because we could talk on and on about what's in the news, but I think that it's our responsibility to also look at this psychologically, what's going oh, on here. right. Well, yeah, I had three thoughts about that. I'll try to slow it down. One is what's in the news right there. I, I just wrote down several notes from the news this morning, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, it, it, I, my, my thought is like think, uh, think archetypally, uh, and apply it locally. So the archetypal dimensions are in the news right now in, in many big forms. Uh, so we can look at some of the particulars. Um, the, in terms of diagnosis, yes, uh, uh, the psychologists that have diagnosed Trump in that way have been severely criticized. Uh, to some de- de- important degree, uh, you really can't diagnose a person without, uh, you know, working with them, uh, like privately in a therapeutic setting. Uh, but you certainly can, in a Jungian sense, particularly, you can diagnose their behaviors and their actions yes. as being a pathological and narcissistic. Hillman was really good at that. And if you looked at Trump's behaviors and actions and took that as, and and took his persona and diagnosed that, if you will, that is clearly narcissistic. He, he so clearly, uh, you can so clearly illustrate all the important aspects of a narcissistic personality disorder by what we see in Trump publicly, how he's privately and so on. That's another story. Uh, 
but publicly we can diagnose him that way. And you also say that he his gift is that he is an evil genius. He is an evil genius, and uh, he's a genius. You, uh, If you step back and try to look at this objectively, what is happening, this guy is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. And in the article, uh, uh, you, I think you said you posted, uh, I'll be posting on my blog, Jung and Eco Psychology as well. Um, but I, I talk about uh, the incredible uh, ability that he has had uh, first demonstrated by being able to destroy that entire Republican primary field, which had a member of the Bush dynasty in there, Jed Bush from mm -hmm. Florida. He just wiped them out. Uh, that's that's more, all nar uh, politicians to some degree are narcissistic anyway, but I think Trump has more than that, and that's the, the uh, archetype of the tr uh, trickster working for him. But uh, he just has such an incredible ability that he's been able to turn the entire federal government the legislative, uh, judicial, and executive branch on his head. And in my article, I provide a link to an Atlantic Monthly article uh, that details this really well. It is, it is phenomenal. He's been able to turn the Republican Party on his head. Most of the Republicans were against him when uh, he started in the primary, but I think his wife knew him. Melania said uh, uh, she she could see what was coming. That no Trump, I, I can't remember if she said he was going to get uh, elected for a second term, but she was pretty confident he was going to get elected. So she knows his power, and it's a, he calls himself a stable genius. I say it's an evil genius, and he he is uh, like he's an archetypal figure in some way. He has developed that ability with his, the way he counter punches and insults people and so on. But he has this base of 35 to 40 percent that can't be shaken. There's a genius there that uh, in some ways is very similar to the genius that Hitler had. The way, the way he was able to turn the, his whole country around. He had, of course, a lot of people and the brown shirts and all that sort of stuff. But it was that one person. Could Germany have gone down such a dark road without that one person? And Jung talked about Hitler in that way. Um, but the dimension that I as a Jungian add, not all Jungians do, but I think his, he it, almost the embodiment of the archetype of the trickster. Of course, he's... Uh, I think he's an embodiment of the of a narcissistic uh, of narcissist of a narcissistic personality disorder. He's kind of it, it epitomizes that, but uh, bigger than that is he has mastered the trickster ability. The number of lies that he tells any given day. Uh, if if Obama would have said one or two of these things, Fox News or this kind of propaganda network. Uh, would have been going on for months uh, about it. But Trump gets away with this every day. And that's uh, the Greeks recognized uh, the uh, sacredness of the trickster energy uh, in Hermes. And I'm positing that the myth of Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle is a myth for our times, especially for eco psychology. Mm -hmm. And to put it back into framework, what you were saying before about uh, going uh, on about science and pathology and so on. But the Greeks, uh, in the myth of uh, Homeric hymn to Hermes, the myth of Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle, they brought together the sacred dimension of science, which is Apollo. We think of the Apollo moonshot. And Hermes, that more connected to the body and the feminine and intuition and the indeterminate. They brought those two domains together in the myth of Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle. So the archetypal dimension in Western culture for science would be Apollo. And that archetypal dimension for kind of psychology and diplomats and businessmen 
um, and the unconscious and the body and so on, that's Hermes. Uh, so our challenge always is to to have those two in relationship to each other. And Trump has been such a great example of using that hermetic trickster energy. Uh, the important thing to rep- remember about Hermes as well is he can lead the way or lead astray. And and Trump is able to, I, I think he's an embodiment of an aspect of the trickster. Not all tricksters are, uh, do things uh, do things that are so destructive in a way, but one of the very important dimensions of the archetype of the trickster is to hold up a mirror to a culture, and Trump is doing that so well. He is really showing the dark underbelly of American culture, the xenophobia, the racism, um, all of that sort of thing. And right now, actually, the distrust of experts and authorities and the scientific community. Uh, that's a big part of America, the, the white supremacist and so on. Trump has been courting those, but he's so gifted with his trickster energy that, that he can court them and then, then he can – and he, he, he seems like he's kind of denying them, but you listen to his rallies, he, he calls that out again. That's a genius to be able to do that sort of thing, to walk that line. I haven't seen anybody else in my lifetime who's been able to do it like that. And to me, that's why this, uh, con- this archetypal construct, uh, it, I think, is so important when we look at Trump. Would you tell us a little bit about Hermes because you say Hermes is the god alive at the moment. Oh, yes. Um, I think my most creative book, actually, is of the Dairy Farmer's Guide. Uh, volume 1 sets all of the, the basics for Jungian eco-psychology. But to develop the mythic dimension for Jungian eco-psychology, that's in Volume 3, called Hermes, Eco-Psychology, and Complexity Theory. And the, I do an exegesis of the myth of Hermes stealing Apollo's cattle. I do the Jungian thing of uh, looking at every element uh, in the tale, looking at the symbolic dimensions and then tying it all together for the storyline, the basic narrative of the tale. And um, I'll try to really be brief because uh, Hermes is the one god that, Greek god that I've studied most intensely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was the god of, of Jung and also the god of, uh, of Winnicott. Uh, so Hermes was, uh, the myth is that, um, just briefly, that Zeus' son is one of his many sexcapades, escapades, uh, when Hera was asleep, went out and had intercourse with uh, Maya. She was a nymph. This was like a tree spirit uh, in a cave, and uh, she had been removed from the gods. And Zeus does this because he has some something in mind, something that he knows has to happen. Um, so it and it has to happen at night when nobody else can see it, and that's how Hermes is born. And he jumps out of his mother's womb, and. Uh, 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 day old Hermes goes out into the world, steals 50 of Apollo's cattle. Apollo's was Zeus's favorite, if you will. Uh, Apollo could look into the mind of Zeus, steals the cattle from Apollo, sacrifices uh, them uh, to all the Greek gods and to himself. He's not even a god and said he's going to bring honor to his mother. So the whole story then is about how then Apollo uh, finds out and comes and, and wants to kill uh, Hermes, but Hermes as a trickster is able to get away from it. And they, he's hauled off in front of all the gods and Zeus, and Zeus commands the two of them to be brothers. And the tale goes on from there. So Hermes, and I develop it in the tale, is very much about the connection to the body, to the unconscious, to the feminine. Um, And one of the avenues for me is that 
one of the things Apollo gave Hermes was a bee oracle. And as an entomologist, I jumped on that. Um, so this is an oracle that Apollo didn't use, but the bees are very much connected in a way with the archetypal feminine, at least the way it was in the tale. There were three maidens. Uh, and the, the uh, beliefs were that uh, bees kind of gave the gift of the, the muses to people that they favored. So Hermes is very much connected. He was an honor, uh, a follower of the goddess uh, Nemesine. And Nemesine is the mother of the muses. She's the goddess of memory and inspires the muses and the artists and the poets. So Hermes is very much connected with the realm of inspiration, poetry, and so on, whereas Apollo was very much more about the scientific, rational side. Mm -hmm. And we need both of them. And this myth is about how the Greeks brought that together. And the exegesis, the uh, going into the details of that myth, is what's in my volume three. And I think one of my more original contributions, and this is a way to bring the humanities into the sciences, if you look at this revolutionary development in mathematics called complexity theory, it's I call it the archetypal feminine in mathematics. It's about process. It's about the emergence of new things. It's about unsuspected things. Um, it's what happens when you go from a stable form toward total chaos. That in between state is when things can transform. And if you look at all the attributes of Hermes, um, those are the things that he really represents. So Hermes uh, is, was the mythological presentation 2,500 years ago. Uh, that's when the myth of Hermes came into existence the Greeks were really talking about complexity theory. So that's how as a Jungian, you put these archetypal constructs um, on, and onto just about everything you work with. Mm -hmm. And as a scientist, I was so excited about that. But, uh, and, and so now we are in one of those hermetic moments. Hermes is the god of transitions, uh, uh, dawn and dusk, birth and death. Uh, that's one of his domains. The, the door hinges uh, are uh, belong to Hermes. So any big initiations. We are in an incredible period of chaos and uncertainty. This is uh, a hermetic moment that we are in on a planetary scale. And you mentioned in your article that even the presumed source of this virus has archetypal dimensions. Yes, I did provide a link. And so I have a daughter living in Hong Kong. I have a son living in England. He, he was living in Cambridge for some time. Absolutely loved it there. Um, so he was calling me. Both of my kids have been kind of paranoid about what could happen to my wife and I because they can see how unprotected. You know, these are not scientists, but living in other countries – they could see what was going to happen to America. And here, Trump not listening to the epidemiologist anyway. Uh, so my son was telling me that it stock up on your food, Dad. He insisted I order gloves um, and masks and so on. Masks haven't come yet. About, about two weeks uh, before it started to hit here. Um, but... Um, so, I'm sorry, what was your question again? I got about off. About the archetypal dimensions of the oh, yes. source so of the virus. Oh, yes. My son, who sent me a link uh, to a program uh, uh, from Australia, some Australian journalist was interviewing a man who's made it his, uh, um, one of his uh, meaningful things to do in life was to try to shut down the so-called wet markets in Asia. And this video, the link is in the article, uh, they take a secret camera into the one of the wet markets. It wasn't in China, it was some other East Asian countries. And the thing is that a lot of the wealthier uh, Asians like uh, wild animal meat. They have these illegal, what are illegal in most of the countries market, but they survive before uh, paying off uh, 
uh, public officials and so on. They bring in wild animals from all over the world. So there in like uh, China, they, they would have wild animals from Brazil and from the Amazon rainforest and so on. And like I said, every animal has viruses. Mm -hmm. They bring them all together. No way that these animals would ever be brought together, even in a zoo for most of them. And then they stack them all together, packed together in these cages, cages stack one on top of the other. The animals below the, the higher cages are being defecated on and urinated on because they're just there until they're slaughtered. So you have these humans handling these animals under stress, which means that they're more likely to, for their uh, pathogens to um, make them ill. So that that's how the virus jumps from wild animals in these and can uh, com combine in these uh, unusual forms. And what this um, crusader said is that this is nature's revenge to human beings. Mm. It's, it's, I think it's so incredibly symbolic that it's the wild animals in, in these terrible conditions. It's kind of symbolic of what we've done to the whole world of nature. That's, again, why this moment is so poignant. Because, I mean, if you were, if you were uh, a, a type of Christian in that, that says God has a plan, uh, I would think that, wow, maybe God is using nature to say something about what we've done to his natural creation. And another poignancy of the moment, this is Holy Week for the Christians. Mm -hmm. This is Ramadan. This, I think today is the first day of Passover. So the main, the book religions, uh, that uh, that uh, covers so much of the world, I have so much of the world in terms of believers. Jung would have looked at this, I think, and said, well, what's the message here? And a bigger message and a more symbolic uh, uh, dimension of that in terms of the environment and nature is what has been the Judeo-Christian position with regard to nature. So from the beginning, God made humans supposedly, I mean, that's the storyline, in its image, and for many believers, his image, but what, what, what about the feminine? Mm -hmm. um, but what about, if you look at any indigenous culture, uh, the animals are sacred, the trees are sacred, the water is sacred. Uh, I had the good fortune, we talked about that in the, the first interview you did with me, about uh, being able to participate in a lot of Lakota Sioux ceremonies and living rituals, sun dances, vision quests, pipe ceremonies, sweat lodges, and so on. And um, so to have a real feel for that. Um, and and the, the, there are spirits in nature. You, you, you try to find out what your spirit animal is. That becomes your medicine, your guide, just like a guardian angel in Christianity. Um, so the so I'm thinking of the fact that this is it's being talked about by that uh, it's not the Surgeon General but the military man who uh, is one of the top people working uh, in the administration uh, with the virus. He's saying this is our this week is our 9/11 uh, in our Pearl Harbor. And it's also the week where these major religions, it's, it's one of the uh, focal points of these uh, religious traditions. Uh, we have to put that all together. And what's the message here? So Jung said that, um, that uh, the, uh, one of the main problems with the Judeo-Christian tradition, particularly in Christianity, is that we don't see nature, uh, nature as sacred, mm -hmm. and we are to uh, use it for our benefit in terms of progress and so on. And that's why Jung was so excited about Merlin. He really identified with Merlin uh, and the Grail legend, and he saw that as within the Christian collective unconscious to try to get back to a sense of the sacred in nature of the body and the feminine, the things that had been left out of the, the, the Christian dogma and beliefs. And he saw Merlin 
as a central figure in that Grail legend. And Merlin was uh, uh, was conceived by the devil as a counterpoint to the divine conception by the Virgin Mary. But because uh, Merlin was tutored by a monk, he didn't get into the dark side, if you will. So for Jung, who said that our um, one of the main things for modern men and women to do was to unite their cultured side with the two million year old man within. And for him, that archetypal image was Merlin. Here was somebody who had the connection with the shamanic background, uh, with the um, druids and all the shamanic dimensions of all the pagan cultures that all of us in the West, if you go back far enough, came from. Uh, but Christianity uh, demonized all that. They were called heathens and so on. We tried to put that down. And Jung said the big challenge for Christianity is to go back and to undo or to re uh, what the what the what we had done in demonizing our indigenous roots. Um, and in America, uh, for us, the challenge is to really look at what we did with the Native Americans. And then bringing it back to the moment again, we deliberately spread our diseases to the Native Americans. The Native Americans were in the same position with regard to West, the, the West, uh, the Europeans coming in as now the whole planet is with regard to the virus. It's a new virus. It's, that's why they call it a unique virus. That's why we have no antibodies. That's why we are so vulnerable to it. So our diseases that we brought in wiped out. I don't know how many million Native Americans they were, were here, but it was almost like AIDS going through the gay community initially. It just wiped out almost the gay community. It was a new virus. But um, for the Native Americans, all of our diseases, especially something like smallpox, was moved and wiped it out. And then because they were heathens and pagans, we deliberately gave them blankets infested with smallpox. We deliberately gave them, well, it's another aspect, but whiskey and so on, uh, uh, to because that was uh, the alcohol was something they they hadn't had and we know how powerful alcohol can be, but that is part of our relationship here in America with regard to the the uh, uh, in, indigenous peoples of the country and now we as white people, especially privileged white people. Um, uh, are, are seeing how terrifying uh, that can be to deal with an unknown disease. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be as bad as, as uh, smallpox in a way. Most people are not going to uh, get the virus and die at uh, a rather terrible death without family and friends. But when, when most of your population are dying from this ugly disease called smallpox, uh, that's the nightmare that we have to think about what uh, what we've done to the Native Americans. I just want to go back to a couple things you said, um, that this virus is unique, and that's why it's called the novel coronavirus. Right. right. And you write about Merlin in Volume 2 of the Dairy Farmer's Guide to the Universe. I'm holding it in my hands right now. It's called The Cry of Merlin, Jung, the Prototypical Eco-Psychologist. And the cover image that you've chosen for this book is something that Jung carved. It's a stone carving at Bollingen, and you say that Bollingen was a place that Jung associated with Merlin, and just uh, kind of synchronistically, I've booked Rick Levine, uh, who is not a Jungian analyst, but he is a Jungian astrologer. His nickname is Merlin, and he's going to be joining us in a few weeks to talk Excellent. about Jung and Freud and Pluto. So Merlin was very special to Jung. And I was wondering if you would just tell us a little bit about that and why that is significant at this time. Well, um, archetypes were Jung, uh, Jungian psychology has been called archetypal psychology, especially the, the way Hillman developed it. Uh, and the archetypal image for this uh, crucial archetype of 
the human relationship with nature. That image for Jung was Merlin, for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, as the hero, he thought of the Grail legend. Mm -hmm. And just an aside there, Jung made a statement in that incredible interview, you can see it online, face-to-face -face interview with Jung in 1959, uh, saying that we had not evolved past the latter part of the Middle Ages. Well, that's when the myth of Merlin and the Grail legend emerged. So in Jung's mind, uh, Merlin was the figure uh, to help us make that evolution. And that is basically to uh, integrate the Christian side uh, back into a sense of the sacredness with nature, which is what the alchemists were doing. So Jung said that the secret of Merlin was carried on by the alchemist, and the alchemy became Jung's main symbolic system. Of course, all the medical authorities and and academia just uh, was saw that as further proof that Jung went over the edge. But uh, that was uh, one of Jung's main archetypal images, and he jokingly said that when Merlin goes into the wilderness, uh, he escapes to Bollingen. Uh, so he thought of that as being Merlin's retreat. And there were many reasons for that, and I go uh, into that, uh, into those reasons in my, my book on the cry of Merlin. Uh, the cry of Merlin actually comes from, there are many tales about Merlin, but um, in some of them, uh, he just got so fed up. He was trying to help some of the Christian kings and so on, uh, but he was just got so discouraged. He kind of was like Lao Tzu. Was just I'm going to get out of here. So he would disappear. He disappeared into the woods. Uh, but once in a while, you could hear uh, him crying in the woods. And so that was called a cry of Merlin. Um, and Jung thought that he was was hearing that voice and trying to honor it by incorporating it into his psychology. Mm -hmm. And that image, that, that's the picture I took. Um, he carved that image in 1958, two years before he died. And to me, it's emblematic of how important he thought, uh, to him, this idea of the age of Aquarius was. Um, and it shows, it's an image of a naked woman, and I think the face looks like Jung, so I, I imagine that as Jung imagining himself as a woman, and he's reaching out kind of reverently uh, to milk a mare. Mm -hmm. And the comments on that, and I'll read it from the, uh, the back, uh, back cover of the book where I talked about it. I said, Jung's relief carving on the side of the Bollingen Tower, a place he associated with Merlin, and he had an inscription in there that he carved, and the inscription says, may the light arise, which I have borne in my body. So just that part. It's not the light coming from above, like a divine revelation. Right. It's the light coming from below, uh, from the realm of Hermes, from the realm of nature and the body and so on. But uh, uh, Christianity used to believe that there were two ways you could find out about God. One was by revelation. And one was by looking at God's creation, if you will. So this this Merlin approach is an emphasis on the the the, the knowledge about the divine that you can get from the body. Continue with what I wrote there. The woman reaching out to milk the mare is Jung's anima, his inner feminine, what he called a millennia old ancestress. Images the, is the anticipation of the age of Aquarius under the constellation of Pegasus, the winged horse. The feminine element is said to receive a special role in this new eon. Jung suggested that the springs gushing forth from the hoof prints of Pegasus, also known as the font horse, are associated with the water bearer, the symbol of Aquarius. And the way Jung read it, and it is talked about in... Um, his autobiography, and I mentioned that in the volume two, mm -hmm. 
is that above the symbol for Aquarius is the image of a, of a Pegasus, the constellation of a Pegasus. Aquarius is a water sign, uh, uh, air sign associated more with thinking. It's not a water sign, it's the water bearer. So it can deliberately pour uh, uh, or focus on or orient uh, psychological energy. And be, beneath Aquarius is the southern fish. So Jung's, as far as he could look into the future, his idea was that what the age of Aquarius was, would be about, was to bring as much conscious energy into the unconscious. So the water bearer is, as Jung imagined, is going to be pouring water into the mouth of the southern fish, a fish symbolic of the unconscious that lives in the water. It's an object in the water, so symbolic. And and that's uh, as far as Jung could look into the future. So the age of Aquarius, Jung associated the age of Pisces with the Christian era, those three wise men coming from the East mm-hmm. Rock, the astrologers. Um, and so they could see that something was happening in the collective unconscious, if you will. So he associated um, the birth of Jesus and the Christian era with the Pisces era, two fish swimming in opposite directions. So as Jung saw it, the first thousand years was to build up the Christian ego, but things beginning began to turn around uh, 1100 and so on. And then Jung thought the very beginning of the age of Aquarius was around 1940. Um, and that's when he called it a new age and the age of Aquarius. And But there's whenever you go from one era to another, uh, there's a lot of chaos, a lot of fear. These old forms have to break down. And Jung thought that the religious forms had ossified. They no longer, they no longer carried life. The religious forms are really there to help us make those archetypal transitions in life. Uh, at birth, the Christians have baptism. Uh, the uh, Jews had the bar mitzvahs and the bat uh, mitzvahs for adolescents. Uh, Catholics have the uh, the uh, first communion. Um, and then uh, the marriage ceremonies, and then the death uh, uh, rituals and so on. Those are archetypal moments, and the religions are, are supposed to have the, the rituals to help us move through those archetypal spaces. But when 30% of your young people um, write down, check off none of the above when it comes to religion, what are the archetypal containers to help them move through these fearful moments and these transitional periods? And Jung said that one of the qualities of the New Age was that new spiritual forms were going to emerge. And to me, the New Age started in 1968, my first full year graduate uh, school in Berkeley when I was 1A for the draft three times and so on. Uh, when Martin Luther King was killed, when Robert Kennedy was killed, the Democratic Convention, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, I just felt I was in the heart of the beast uh, being in Berkeley and a pretty avid anti-war protester. But um, those are the big transitional moments, and that's where we are right now especially. Uh, And one of the biggest transitional moments is death. Uh, Birth and death are the two strongest archetypal um, archetypes, if you will. And that's why this moment is so poignant because death is literally all around us. If you go outside, you have to look at a fellow human being as a potential vector for a virus. That's a terrible way to have to look at other human beings. Yeah. We're all yeah. isolating in place. We're being cut off. So it's a time when we really have to reflect about who we are, who our culture is, what politicians we are supporting, and so on. Uh, and and to me, getting back to Trump, in a way, he's the perfect person to have um, in a position of power now. We're the most powerful nation. We've got uh, Trump uh, there as the trickster, really showing us how ugly America can be, really showing the world and hopefully ourselves this dark side. 
And then when you look at the fact to, to show that um, in a way the religious forms are dead, a big part of Trump's supporters are the evangelicals, supposedly the most Christian people out there. But for them to support a racist, a xenophobe, a misogynist, a president, and so on, where is the message of Jesus? So I am personally, just to get a little personal here, um, when I started going to church, my parents were agnostic at best. And I, my most difficult period was in the seventh grade. I couldn't get to sleep. So I, I thought maybe science had the answer, read science. Uh, Thoreau was my first big hero. But then I uh, read a classic uh, illustrated book on the life of Jesus, and it just went, wow. Uh, I had no idea that Jesus uh, uh, talked about, you know, when, when I was hungry and did you feed me? And, you know, when I was homeless and so on, I said, that's, that's a pretty radical message there. Uh, and then the Good Samaritan, but I said, my gosh, here we have our Catholic neighbor. I grew up in a farm in very rural Wisconsin. Our Catholic farmer nature, neighbor didn't go to his son's wedding because he married a Lutheran. He said, so are the Lutherans then the, uh, the Samaritans? Um, you know, and, and um, so, uh, and then I read in college Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was uh, the spiritual leader for a group that tried to assassinate uh, Hitler, and he talked about sugar-coated Christianity. Um, so, I, and I think about it, we, it, it is pretty clear that the evangelicals really have a, uh, I think, a distorted image of Christianity. But Jung said, like to AA, he was an inspiration for Alcoholics Anonymous, said you can't just tell somebody to stop doing something like stop drinking. You have to have something equally powerful to replace it. And so what I'm looking at and what some of my writings are, I call it the new psychoanalytic Jesus, is what are... What are the positive elements in Christianity? I think there's a baby in the bathwater. And if you can can show the Christian world that, yeah, Jung isn't out to demonize you guys or whatever, but it's uh, in a way it's like he's saying look more deeply and symbolically at your religion and what he called a self. Because Jung would say uh, yeah, you could say Jesus is a self-image in our culture. Uh, if that works for you, it works in your culture. But don't don't say that somebody who's a follower of Buddha, uh, for who that would be a self-image, or a follower of Muhammad, that they are the enemy. Uh, that type of religious belief is that our planet cannot tolerate anymore. We cannot tolerate hatred at any level, we have to um, listen to each other and come together. And that's uh, what the challenge of our time is. And as an aside, Jung, because of his Christian background, solid, you know, line of ministers on both sides, he saw it as one of his archetypal positions was to um, revitalize the Christian myth. He thought the Christian myth was dead but through alchemy to revitalize it. And that could be his personal contribution. But he gave us a way of working with all religions um, uh, in a way by how he worked with Christianity. He wasn't saying that Christianity is the religion, but he said this is how you look at something as powerful as a religion, how you can put it into an archetypal framework. Because if the saying is power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, then the biggest corrupting power potentially can be spiritual beliefs. In your article, you mentioned that Jung said, nature must not win the game, but she cannot lose. Yeah, I love that quote. Um, so nature must not win. Um, it's kind of a position we are in now. I don't want to sound... Uh, uh, paranoid, I, I don't want to frighten people, but we're assuming that we're going to be able to develop a good vaccine. But if we couldn't, uh, this this is easy to imagine all sorts of apocalyptic mm -hmm. novels and uh, horror movies, and I, and I understand that 
Uh, Terry Gross is interviewing Stephen King today, and he wrote some novel some years ago about uh, some kind of pandemic virus situation. I think The Death of Grass, uh, 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 the novel years ago, was about a virus that wiped out all of the vegetation on the earth. So these are easy ways to imagine what in the book of Revelations is, is about, the destruction of the created world. Um, and if we can't develop a vaccine, then it, it, eventually we're just going to have to live with the fact that a, 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 a huge number, millions of people are going to die from this terrible death from the virus. But I, I think we should be able to, our genetic engineering and the PBS series are now about the, uh, about the gene, um, uh, we'll probably be able to develop a vaccine quicker than we could have done even a few years ago, thanks to CRISPR technology and so on. Um, but, uh, so, but there are scenarios where nature could win. Um, nature bats last is a, uh, another saying, and I don't think Jung said it, but um, humans, um, we're, we're, we're showing how fragile all of our systems are right now. The economic systems could collapse. They're probably going to have to throw another two to five billion into this uh, situation. Our total national debt is about twenty-nine trillion. Did I say two to five billion? Two, to, yeah, two to five billion, right? Um, but the no trillion, trillion with a T. Um, so we're just spending like crazy, like the beginning of World War Two. But we've got to stop ourselves from. Uh, we got to stop the virus in its track so we don't lose millions of lives as it is. We probably only lose uh, between 80, 85,000 here in the United States. Um, but that's still a lot of lives. Um, but the, so the economic systems of, on the whole planet, uh, how are they going to recover? And that's why in my article I've referenced um, – uh, Israeli historian Harari, who's talking about how significant this moment is, um, all of a sudden, you know, the government is ready to throw money uh, into the economy to uh, provide unemployment insurance and, um, and cover health care insurances and all this. Everything is in flux. And it's really important how we deal with this hermetic trans, uh, hermetic transitory moment. Uh, what comes out of this uh, is probably going to be in place for some time in uh, evolutionary biology. They call it punctuated evolution. There's a lot of change rather quickly. And then when a new, the new form emerges, it may stay that way for a long time. So, what we are experimenting with is, is things like social safety nets and guaranteed national incomes and that sort of thing. Um, so it's what happens during revolutionary periods, but they're also dangerous. Uh, think what happened with the French Revolution when it got out of hand. I referenced the hexagram in the Jing Revolution. You don't engage them lightly. We didn't have a choice here. We've been pushed into a revolutionary period by the virus, but we must take advantage of it. One of the positive things about death is that it kills off old, dead forms. I think some of those old, dead forms can be some of the religious forms. In any fundamentalist religion, fundamentalism is what Hillman called a literalization of religions. Um, and those forms become empty and dogmatic. But uh, economic forms, this hopefully will put some end to the neoliberalism that has been dominating, especially since Reagan started. All these worshipers of Reagan, he got in there. One thing he did is he fired the uh, air controllers uh, uh, at the airports and brought in what the uh, union uh uh, members would call scab laborers. So from the beginning, uh, he had been, uh, he instigated these uh, elements of neoliberalism, of, uh, of uh, getting rid of uh, regulations, 
of privatizing things, of laissez-faire capitalism and so on. And one of the things that I, that I mentioned in my article, and this is something else that Jungian psychology brings to the moment, is that um, we have all these laws and rules and enforcements and so on, and, and they seem so abstract, but they are deadly. You look at the consequences of how our healthcare system is set up, and one of the reasons so many poor people and African Americans are so vulnerable to the virus is because they they are not in good health because of the economic situations and for African Americans, racism and so on. They have poor diets. They don't. Um, uh, they have a, a higher blood pressure, and uh, there's more obesity. There's more asthma and so on. These are all things that make you more vulnerable to this disease. Right now in America, we're finding out that twice as many, uh, the death rate in, with African Americans is twice as high as that for non-African Americans. It's because of these reasons. And Fauci this morning said that uh, after this is over, we have to look at the underlying reasons why so many African Americans are where they are. So that's another thing that hopefully will come out of this revolutionary period is that we work more toward income inequality, we address the racial issues, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I open by saying that uh, Milwaukee is like the tip of the spear. I woke up this morning and the first news I heard was about the elections we held here in Wisconsin yesterday. The first election to be held in a pandemic when you are supposed to have social isolation. So the racial issues were so clear here. Um, Milwaukee had 120 polling stations. Uh, they reduced them to five yesterday. Uh, most of the African-American population in the state is in Milwaukee. It's been a political football for the conservatives in the state forever. Um, and it's... Uh, we had had uh, a long tradition of socialist mayors here. Of any large city, Milwaukee by far had the most socialist mayors. I think we had at least three, three decades of them. And because of that, our public health care system was so good that uh, they, when they used to do the annual assessment of cities for public health care, Milwaukee's was so good that there were years when they took Milwaukee out of the consideration uh, because we were always number one. Well, now that has all been decimated by these years of neoliberalism here in the state. Um, and so the and Milwaukee is is suffering in a way some of the highest consequences. The Democratic Convention was supposed to be here. That's probably not going to be here. One of the reasons it was to be here, because we're, we're a borderline of uh, battleground state. Uh, it's about 50-50 in terms of Democrat, Republican, and so on. So all the issues are, are very alive here. Plus, in terms of uh, isolation, uh, our basketball team, the Bucks, uh, had a very good chance, thanks to Giannis, who was an illegal immigrant or was an Ima, a Nigerian immigrant in Greece. That's why he has this um, pronounceable last name. Um, but because of him, we, were, uh, we could have gone, uh, hopefully, to the NBA Finals. Uh, our baseball team got knocked out by the team that went on to win, win the World Series last year. We had high hopes. So we, uh, in terms of archetypes, uh, you try to look at how they're applying at your local level. And uh, I, I think of Milwaukee as being at the tip of, of the spear of what's going on in our racial issues. Milwaukee is one of the most, it's called hyper-segregation here. Uh, we're some of the most segregated, one of the most segregated cities in the country. And what, the death rates that we're going to have, um, and, and many of them will be African Americans who try to get out to vote, yesterday because they realized what was at stake. It's going to be higher now because of this virus. So the Republican Party has some blood on its hands, just like Trump does. That's how I see this situation as a pathologist. They, the, 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 the voter suppression, suppression has been a part 
of the Republican Party for some time. This idea of of um, uh, uh, illegal voting, that's a thin screen for suppressing the minority vote. The, the votes that are illegal is something like 0 0.04, like four votes out of 1,000 or 10,000 are really illegal. So to do that, you actually make it much more difficult for African Americans to be able to vote by limiting voting sites, limiting the number of hours that they can work and that sort of stuff. Um, but now, because of the virus, again, highlighting things, uh, the deadly aspects of your laws and of your systems are being played out. So that was a long, I just realized what the issue I was going to talk about is by personification, Jung and Hillman talked about personifying the systems in your culture. So Jung talked, he said, the modern day monsters and dragons were the big things, big machines, big governments, big militaries. But the particular example he gave was, he said, uh, in paraphrasing, imagine how the little merchants felt when they were gobbled up by the Standard Oil Trust. Well, that Standard Oil Trust, the modern day equivalent would be the corporation. So because of the Citizens United decision, the corporations has the rights of a person. So to personify a corporation as a person, it would be a person that's always trying to eliminate the competition. Uh, it's, its only goal is to make money for the shareholders. That is assessed on a quarterly basis. It's not the sediment generation basis of Native Americans. And the environment is a resource base and a waste dump. So I think you think of Trump as a narcissist. By the, Jung would have assessed the modern corporation as a, the, a narcissist um, that is a monster that is ruling the whole planet. And we should be thinking of the corporation in that fearful a term. But to change the, the, the scope of the work ahead of us to bring about a paradigm shift at this level of addressing our systems um, is to, to have to change the corporate model. And that's why I'm excited about the work of what I call the green economist or the sustainable economist. And I reference a book, Enough is Enough. There are several good ones out there. Um, but some of the, the, the premise there is you put the environment at the center of your economic system, not at the periphery and as a waste dump. And then you set up systems based on that central aspect, that the, the center as the environment as the self in a way for the economic system. And some of the premises for the green economy um, is that we have to, there are not enough jobs with automation. That's another thing that hasn't really, that hasn't really been addressed well is a lot, there are a lot of people aren't going to have jobs because of automation. Uh, and this is encroaching into the white collar world in a way. So there aren't enough jobs. We have to, we have to start thinking as a species, not just as, you know, a Chinese person or a European or an American or a South American. So we have to think of a species in terms of equal job distribution, uh, more equal income distribution um, around the planet. Um, we have to limit our population numbers. That's another part of sustainable economy. So if you have a religion that's still advocating uh, be fruitful and multiply, we are we cannot do that anymore. That. That, it, that religious concept has to go. That powerful religious concept has to go. That's why you need something that can analyze these problems at the deepest level, which is what deep, deep ecology is. And what Jung offers us, we can analyze environmental problems uh, at the level of analyzing the dysfunctional environmental positions that the some of the dominant religions in the world are putting us in. So we have to think as a species and as a biologist coming into Jung, I realized when I was finishing writing my books, is that, wow, that's one of the things that 
had attracted me to Jung. I was not aware at the time how ecological Jung and how biological Jung's concepts were. So one of the things we have to realize as a species is how totally unique we are. Every species affects its environment, manipulates it to some extent. What is unique about us is that we are able to figure out the laws of nature, if you will, and bend them all to our advantage. And one of the laws of nature is that diseases uh, serve a real role. If you think of the yin-yang symbol and that dark yang with the white spot in the middle, that dark yang energy is our diseases in terms of the white being life. But that white spot in there, diseases are necessary for life to survive because when any population gets too large um, and starts to uh, uh, like uh, eat up all of its resources and the population gets weaker, rather than just eat up all the grass like if you're a deer and then everybody dies, the more vulnerable members of the population are susceptible to the disease. So the disease serves that function. Now, if you come along as a human and, you know, the great mother archetype wants her children to be free of disease. She wants food, clothing, shelter, and I would add a relatively stable environment. So the science, Apollo, uh, comes in and we use our science to cure the diseases. But then you have to then consciously limit your population numbers because you're going you're gonna to overpopulate the planet with your species, which is what has happened to our species. We have outgrown, I think as if everybody lived like an American did, uh, we would need six planets. Uh, so all this has to change. These are fundamental changes. But we cannot make America great again by going back to the consumption consumption type habits we had in the 50s with those huge American gas guzzling cars and all that sort of right. stuff. These are the paradigm. These are all parts of the paradigm shift. And this is how I fit the biology, basic biology and diseases into a Jungian framework in the present moment. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go back to something I mentioned in the intro, which is the what Jung called the two million year old man within. Would you just tell us a little bit about what he meant by that? I'm glad you asked that. I um, two million year old man to me goes back a little too far. That's about where Lucy, um, you know, way back in our ancestry, Jung. Jung talked about, uh, and this is where I have some trouble with Jung, uh, he talked about archetypes as images of the instincts, and the biologists know that part of the power of our species is we do not have not a lot of instincts. We are basically, because of our big brain, most of what we have is, was in computer terms, would be soft wiring. Uh, we uh, adapt to things, and we develop sciences and technologies and institutions and things to uh, enable us to live successfully. But at the two million year old man level, you're more at the instinctual level. And, and Jung, Jung thought about, I think he was a little too naive in thinking that um, what, uh, if we could go back to nature, that was a part of what was uh, archetypal image that gripped the Europeans. Rousseau, I think, was one of them, something about the noble savage and that type of thing. Um, and that, uh, and live like nature, we would be, uh, we would be better off. Um, he did associate those deeper levels with sexuality uh, and so on, which is another thing that, that Christianity had made a big problem for us in the West, especially for men. But the, um, so the two million year old man, we we uh, the the best way I can think of it, and I provided the image for uh, on the talk that I gave for this eco psychology network. Uh, if you don't have, um, well, I actually put that in. I think twenty page twenty five of uh, my volume one, the the image of the layers of the collective unconscious. 
that's the best way I think to talk about the two million year old man within. Um, so, and it, it demystifies uh, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. So the idea is you have to think of like, a, think of like the Hawaiian islands. There's a good example. So, uh, so you're on one of the Hawaiian islands. And if you think of one of those islands as being your ego, uh, so it's above water. So the above water part is consciousness. So you're on the big island in Hawaii. Uh, you are conscious. Now, Jung thought that the family level of the collect of the unconscious, uh, the family level of your inheritance could be conscious as well. I think a lot of that it can be in in the unconscious. Um, and I think well, Jung was a little off on that. But then beneath the family level, now we're going below water. So the first level below that, kind of like the extended family, like the clan. But um, now if you think of the big island being connected to the island to the west of it, um, that island, let's say that island would re- represent Europe. Um, the European consciousness. So we share that deeper love, that next level with the Europeans. Whoops, I skipped the le- level. The level. Um, beneath the family level, the clan level would be the nationality. So Americans are different from the Europeans. Um, so that's part of our collective. That's part of the water that the, the, we as American fish are born into. The cowboy myths, what are our myths and how does that distinguish us? From the beginning, we were the white shining city on the hill here and, and so on. So that's the collective level. Now, if you go to the, the island to the east, I think it might be o- Oahu um, in, ho- in uh, the Hawaiian chain of islands. The European level of our collective unconscious. So we have all these European uh, traditions um, that with the development of science, uh, the European religions, the Christianity, and so on, and the influence uh, um, uh, from uh, the Middle East, the Judeo-Christian traditions, and so on, and so on. Then you go to, uh, and then, so the European level um uh, you, you go going, going back to the islands, going further east. So this is an appropriate metaphor. Did I say go west? I meant go east. Uh, going to the east. So the Europeans are different from the island further to the east, like some of the eastern mentalities. But that's a big uh, domain. I mean, what are you talking about? The Buddhism, different types of Buddhism. But some pretty fundamental differences between Christianity, Judeo-Christian traditions, and the religions in the East, Buddhism and Shintoism, uh, Taoism, and that sort of stuff. That's uh, uh, another part of the island chain. Uh, So then you go beneath the European tradition is what Jung called the indigenous ancestors, and that's that's still not the two-million-year-old man. So in the West, we all had indigenous ancestors. My mother's side is Bohemian Czech, so the the, the Slavic uh, pagan elements that got Christianized and so on. You know, talked a lot about that. He said one of the problems we had in the West is that we had this more advanced religion, namely Christianity, come out of the Middle East, and it suppressed all of the pagan religions they weren't able to evolve naturally so it subjugated and demonized the indigenous uh, uh, cultures and then their sacred connection in nature they became the heathens and so on and the witches and so on and we burned the witches because they had the nat- the natural knowledge uh, and, and Jung said that we have to reintegrate, we have to reconnect with those energies. So now we're getting toward the two million year old man. Jung said that the, the foundational level 
in the collective unconscious is the animal ancestors. We are animals. We are humans are thinking animals. We have all the basic needs of an animal, food, clothing, shelter, and a, and a particular uh, type of environment that we can survive in, climate-wise, if you will. Um, and that's the level. Uh, Jung said that the, 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 the imagery for that is uh, the caveman. So the cavemen moved into caves that the cave bears had been in. So that was kind of symbolic of the, the, the human animal connection. And to me, thanks to my Native American experience and, and having done a vision quest, that the, you, I, I think that the, the Native Americans, my particular connection is with the Lakota Sioux on the rose, but I'm so grateful for them for sharing their incredible ceremonies with them and to have a living experience of a ritual that connects you with nature. Um, but the young men, as soon as they hit puberty, would do the vision quest Four days and nights without food and water, crying for a vision. You feel like you're going to die. you got a sacred container. People are praying for you. The holy man, the shaman, uh, is thinking of you. And when the body is under that kind of stress, you hope to get your image of a spirit animal. Mm -hmm. And that is your guide. So, And Hillman talked about dreams as being the zoological cathedrals. Hillman was really big on animals and dreams. Um, and when you have an animal as a self-image, you have a lot more imagery than you can get from, uh, like, just the Christian iconography and so on. That's why the Renaissance was so powerful, is that when the Greek myths came back to Western culture in places like Florence, uh, it, 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 inspired, it sparked a revolution in our imagination because – now we had all these Greek myths as archetypal imaginal sources, not just limited to the Christian myths. Hillman talked about that as, as harrowing the, the Christian imagination or something. Um, so they, the spirit animals are these, uh, this wonderful, um, image and these, uh, the dream, Hillman said that the dreams are like our zoological cathedrals that this way of relating to the natural world and the animal world is still alive in our dreams. So when we go deeply into our dream life, that's how I found several of my spirit animals. I uh, found one th through uh, Native American ritual, um, and there are many ways you can do it. And I'm always looking for ways with people I work with when there's an animal in a dream or a landscape. Um, I talk a lot in my, that's what inspired my going in, uh, developing new and unique psychology was a dream of a typical Wisconsin meadow, very simple, but it was sacred. So there would be sacred landscapes, and then you want to let that image work on you, just like the uh, uh, Catholics would have their Virgin Mary or their St. Christopher or statue or whatever, that's to keep you within that sacred domain and orient your consciousness. But Jung said all these levels, starting animal soul, uh, two million uh, in indigenous, uh, one within, I call it, the, uh, the national, the, the, uh, the, for us in the West, the European cultural heritage, then the national uh, uh, heritage, then coming up toward the surfacing in the Hawaiian Islands, the clan, and then finally getting above water, the family level and the ego said, this is not a dead museum. All those levels are interacting at once. Um, and then getting back to your question, that two million year old man uh, would be right at that cusp between the indigenous uh, ancestors and the animal ancestors. I like uh, the term that my dear friend Fred Gustafson, who was a Jungian analyst, Lutheran minister, and a sun dancer. And that's how I got started with Native Americans. He called it the indigenous one within. And he wrote a nice book about his experience coming from that background called Dancing Between Two Worlds. Yes, and Dr. Gustafson was a guest on this podcast. And I was wanting to actually dedicate this episode to his memory. He passed away a couple years ago. I was thinking of that, in fact, um, 
to uh, to put myself in the uh, right place, um, I brought my uh, pipe bag down here, which is my my pipe is uh, contained within uh, the fur of, of of one of my spirit animals, and I brought down a hat, which is uh, made of the fur of one of my spirit animals. Um, and that goes back to a big dream I had uh, in Switzerland uh, that helped connect me with that. But uh, what really helped me develop that connection with that realm is is from Fred. But I have that on my my table here in my home office as, as we are speaking. And uh, I just feel fortunate to have known and been friend, uh, friends with uh, somebody like Fred. He was a very, a very special person. And, um, yeah. Yeah. And so you knew him and I never got to meet him, but, uh, he was kind enough to do an episode with me about his book on the black Madonna. And I will put a link to, uh, my talk with Dr. Gustafson in the show notes for this Good. episode. Yeah. And I just would like to remind everyone, um, to visit the website, speaking of com for links to everything that Dr. Merritt is mentioning today. And especially his article, which is the subject of this episode. It's titled COVID-19 Inflection Point in the Anthropocene Era and the Paradigm Shift of Jung's New Age. And I neglected to ask you if you would define for us what the Anthropocene Era is. Yes, um, there's not universal agreement about this, Okay, but there have been many eras, and I'm not a geologist and I don't know all the eras, but they are, uh, era is named um, after the kind of the most significant aspects of that era uh, and, and how it is uh, profoundly different from the preceding era. So, for example, there was an era that terminated when the meteorite hit uh, the Yucatan Peninsula uh, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, and not only wiped out the dinosaurs that were the dominant animal form on the planet for se several million years, I think over 100 million years, and uh, these some little forms, I think they were like mouse size or rat size or something, the, the, were the mammals on the planet. <laughs> of course, they eventually went on to become at its uh, most developed form in one dimension, humans. Um, so uh, then there are another uh, uh, changes, profound changes in other eras was when the planet was totally covered with ice. And just about everything died. So that's how significant an era is. So now there are many people now that are labeling the period we're in now is the Anthropocene era. The era, uh, this period of time on the earth, so profoundly different from anything else, and what is distinguishing it is that it is, the planet has been so modified and affected by one species, namely us human beings, or the Anthropos part of the Anthropocene era. And, and just uh, several basic things. Um, our species, because of climate change, um, is pro and the destruction of natural environment, and because of our population numbers having to convert more and more land into uh, agriculture, and then the corporate agriculture is, is basically mining the land in many ways, then the energy resources that we need are contributing more to climate change, and then we're mining the ocean fisheries and the uh, coral reefs are dying in Australia. That's some of the richest, most biodiverse landforms on the planet. Um, I heard just this morning that there's some rain, some rain, subtropical rainforests in Australia that have survived since the end of the age of dinosaurs. And they, a large part of them had been destroyed by the wildfire. Uh, 
wildfires in Australia that are there because of climate change. So all this climate change stuff and everything, and we're probably going to take down 50% or more of the species on the planet. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, they're just becoming more aware of how the plastics are contaminating the oceans and so on. We don't know what the effect of all those small particles are going to be in our animal systems. Um, and just the poisons that we put into the environment, um, the animal life that we do have, how we're torturing it, how we raise pigs, for example, for pork, uh, cooping up chickens, uh, hardly allowing them to move, uh, the growth hormones we give the dairy cows uh, and the big corporate farms in Wisconsin, uh, the county I came from, I grew up in, is a county, mini Door County, is uh, the one of the most popular tourist areas. Everybody in Chicago and Midwest knows about it. But um, that most of the aquifers in that county are are contaminated by fecal material and nitrates from these huge corporate dairy farms, one to five thousand cows. You have these huge liquid manure uh, holding uh, areas for the manure. And because of the uh, the bedrock being part of the Niagara Escarpment, which is uh, um, the hardened coral forms uh, that was part of the inland coral sea from, I think, going back to the age of the dinosaurs, um, that is that bedrock's close to the surface. It had a lot of cracks in it. The the the, the liquid manure, the bacteria, and so on. I find it easy to get down into the aquifers. That's happening, uh, you know, in my home state, in the area that I grew up in. These are all aspects of the Anthropocene era. And that's why I, I'm, I'm thinking that, uh, to me, the, this virus is just, uh, uh, it's, it's almost inconsequential in terms of the long-term things that are going to happen from climate change. But that's even part of the big, bigger paradigm too. I'd like to end this episode by talking about some of the the good news or where we can go from here. And you mention in your article that the good news is that human created systems are at the root of most of our problems. And because they're human created, they can be changed by humans. Right. But what is going to get that in motion? Are we are we becoming conscious enough to make those changes? That's why I am thinking of the present moment as uh, a turning point. Because when, I mean, we've known about these problems uh, for a long time. Uh, a book that got me started toward eco-psychology uh, it was Silent Spring, came out the year I graduated in high school, 1962. Um, and we've known about the, the, the problem that we've known that in economic systems, we, uh, we know that things can't grow forever, but that's what our systems are based on, especially the capitalist model. These are fundamental things that we've known about forever. Uh, and particularly, like I said, with climate change, even uh, – ExxonMobil scientists knew that this could happen with the research they did in the early uh, 1980s. Uh, but we, but the present administration still is denying that. Trump pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accords and so on, which is another reason that Trump is so good because he's he's showing us all these things in trickster fashion that we shouldn't be doing. But the reason I'm thinking this present moment is so important is that when it comes down, when it gets very personal, when you may be losing your job uh, and have to stay at home, and you may be losing your health insurance, and you yourself may die, or, or if not you, then your grandparents or somebody ill that you know, or maybe a lot of people in your community, like they're living here in Milwaukee, a lot of African Americans that are the people that are cleaning the floors, that are driving the buses, they are the foundational elements. And Hermes is the god of the servants, 
the, the support elements in the society, that, that, that that kind of personal life and death issue that you are experiencing, that hopefully that will wake you up. And if this doesn't shock you into some awareness, I don't know what will. The climate change stuff can seem far off. It's much slower to develop and so on. But there's an immediacy in this uh, pandemic. And it's not an epidemic. It's not something will li- limit to the United States is pan, the god of pan. It's universal. It's a pandemic. So the whole planet's attention is now focused on this making this moment so revolutionary and important. And that kind of shock, uh, it's like a nightmare. And that's the way Jung and Hillman talked about nightmares. They're meant to shock you, to wake you up, to shock you into awareness. And that's why I'm thinking of this as being hopefully an inflection point for our planet and especially here in America. Mm -hmm. I had said in the intro that... Jung believed his psychology was 500 years ahead of its time, and you were hoping to make the case that the time is now. And I was just wondering if there was anything else that you would like to add. Uh, well, um, I could go on for quite a while. <laughs> right, I'm <laughs> sure. Seen, yeah, this is a I, huge I a topic. To, right, I think that's a great way to end. I'm glad you brought that back up. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a quote somewhere. Uh, it might have been 400 years, but uh, Jung was such a deep thinker. And uh, it, he, he, there's some uh, speculation that toward the latter part of his life, he spent half of his time at Bollingen, which was his retreat center. That's what he associated with Merlin. He would go there, no running water, uh, no heat, no electricity, chopped all his wood to burn there, um, painted the Philemon and powerful images from his unconscious there. After his wife died and Tony Wolf, he just about uh, psychically died himself, but he carved a name to all of his ancestors and his wife's ancestors on plaques, put them there. So his family collective unconscious was there and so on. He would go there and he would spend up to three days when he got there, just clearing his mind. He would chop wood or just stare at the water. And then in that space, um, in that collective archetypal realm, if you will, that's where he could get very uh, deeply into the collective and look into the future. He was really a seer. Mm -hmm. He could analyze things collectively. He could see where the culture was heading collectively. And like I said, at that most collective level, he he thought of it as being the age of Aquarius. He saw that a paradigm shift had to come. He died in 1961 before all this stuff, you know, just exploded in the late 60s and so on. So, um, so, and, and most people uh, just, uh, they can't relate to Jung. He's not taught in the universities. Almost all of psychology in the university now is cognitive behavioral. And that begins by ignoring the unconscious and the symbolic realm. But in a Jungian sense, the spiritual dimension, which is who he thought was one of the most important. And he said, if you didn't have a sense of the numinous in your culture and your educational system, you didn't have a holistic culture. Uh, and the this archetypal way of looking at things, uh, you need that kind of perspective uh, on yourself and on your culture. And the cognitive behavioral uh, is supported by the insurance companies, supposedly yeah proven scientifically, there's science coming in again, but they like that because it's all uh, kind of short-term and solution-focused. And in the Jungian sense, the, uh, the symptoms are not there to get rid of. The symptoms are to show you what you have to go into deeply and to work on. And we're finally getting some evidence that shows that these deeper types of therapy, when you check Two or three years down the line, the, the people are doing better than those that had the kind of the behavioral stuff that got rid of the symptoms and seemed to be 
patched up and doing better initially. Not that there's not a lot of good stuff with cognitive behavioral, but to me, it lacks the dimensions that we need now to understand how we got into this functional relationship with each other and with the environment. And that's why I say a Jungian approach is is I think one of the best approach. I'm sure there's other out there, others out there, but I'm doing what I can, and I'm thanking you for offering me and other unions a platform to talk about this at this moment especially. Well, thank you for your willingness to speak about it, Dr. Merritt. I really appreciate you taking the time today to share your thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Please visit the website Speaking of Jung, that's J U N G dot com for more information on everything that was discussed in this episode. There you will also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to stream or to download for free. This podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also listen to this episode on your Amazon Echo device simply by saying, Alexa, play Speaking of Jung on Apple Podcasts or tune in. Just be sure to pronounce Jung with a hard J. So with special thanks to Fisher King Press, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung. <laughs>